myself. As Sarah mentioned, um, I um, come to this work 12 years ago. I'm really with um, uh, out of the legislature, and um, I think that that is a, a great background, really, for me um, to have come to this, but um, really have come to think of myself more as a translator um, of late. Um, you know, really sort of translating between that legislative and administrative state government world and those of you who um, are doing the work across maternal and child health, whether that be in the research space, the practice space, um, spend a lot of time really thinking about how to lift up community voices and the voices of those who are most impacted by the policies. And so um, again, to Sarah's point, I'm glad to think that she thinks I navigate those terrains um, fluidly, but they can be, you know, really quite different. Um, and really thinking about um, even the, the, the way in which we interact when we're, we're talking very specifically about how a policy might impact a community or impact an institution, and then thinking about the messaging about how to actually affect the change when I go to speak to the legislature is, you know, can be, can be different, right? And some folks even, um, you know, it can be a little bit of a hurdle when you show them the talking points or the infographic. I'm going to give you some examples that we use with legislators. Legislators and people say, well, that, that's not, you know, you're not, you're not really giving enough information. You're not really sharing all of what we're doing. And the reality is just that, you know, understanding that a lot of the folks who are part of the decision-making process deal with so many issues that, you know, we really do keep things simple um, usually and um, also live within a political context where, um, you know, we try to, to emphasize those things that you know, are probably most likely to get the job done. And so I'm a practical person. Um, and I always say to folks, um, you know, we, we wanna win um, and we want to move things forward in a way that um, everyone thinks will benefit maternal and child health. And sometimes um, we don't have to win with all the right words. Um, so just setting a little context for the way I think of some of my translation job. So I'm gonna click through, there we go. So um, we talked a little bit already about the council. We were founded in 1983, um, so we're almost 40 years old. Um, I am only the second um, uh, long-term executive director. We had a little short interim between my predecessor who was there for 27 years and myself. So um, lucky in that way, I think, to have some continuity across the organization and the um, CS Mott Children's Hospital is a member of, of my organization, and um, I have benefited, the council has benefited from rich relationships and partnerships all across the university and Michigan Medicine. Um, we have a diverse membership. Um, I, I didn't list the members, but there are five large hospital systems that are members, and then there are also a plethora of statewide organizations across maternal and child health, which are part of our membership and then even local public health departments and several organizations that are comprised really of volunteer type um, memberships. So think of like the school nurses, they don't have a paid staff, but there's a Michigan Association of School Nurses made up of their leadership is um, practicing school nurses mm -hmm. and um, they're a member of the organization as well. So we have a number of those types of groups that are again, sitting at the table, really thinking about how can we work together to improve uh, maternal and child health through policy change. So um, I'm gonna share just a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna read this to you. It sort of runs the gamut of maternal and child health. Anything you can think of, uh, we consider to sort of be in our purview. This is actually our 2021 action agenda, which is me trying to say to our board, beyond all the things you can think about in maternal and child health, what are the things you really want me to work on this year? And so we will embark soon on our process to think about in 2022, what does that look like? So it's both uh, um, what's most urgent, what's most in need, and then what's most also most timely um, from an opportunity standpoint, um, based on sort of conversations that are already um, potentially ongoing in the legislature or in the administration. So um, we never get through the whole list. We never, I, I never get all the, can check all these things. Many of these things get carried forward year to year. That's how policy works. And so, um, as I said, I'm not going to read this to you, but if you were wondering sort of what's in our bucket, these are the things that are in our bucket. And often I get asked about things that I would consider to be just outside the bucket because families are complicated. Um, uh, lives are complicated. They're multidimensional. 
So I'll get asked about things like family law, you know, mm -hmm. adoption, surrogacy, things that seem like, well, maternal and child health, you should care about that. I got asked about a, a bill on dyslexia yesterday. Yes, we care about all those things. They're not something that the council's membership has any expertise to offer, any feedback on. And so we sort of, you know, have to draw a line around what we're interested in and what we engage on and, and what we don't. So um, those, all of those examples would sort of fall outside this list. Do, do you mind if we jump in? Yeah, sure. Now or yeah. Okay, great. Um, so just curious, so, uh, can you be us share a little bit who's on your board and what they look Sure. So um, the requirement under the bylaws um, of my organization is that um, those individuals who represent their organizations on our board. So um, we have 15 members. Um, our membership is by tier and not to get into too much detail. All of the hospital systems are guaranteed a seat on the board based on the amount of dues that they pay. And then other tiers of membership sort of elect within their own, they elect their peers. Mm -hmm. So um, the types of individuals on the board, um, I'll just say from the five large hospital systems, I have um, three um, of the individuals are um, directors of uh, women's and children's services at their hospital. So they're actually the, um, in all three cases, the nursing administrator, sort of running the, running the pediatric floor, running the OB-GYN unit. And then um, the other two are engaged um, in sort of community activities. So government affairs in one case, and then really sort of um, community benefits in all the ways that you think of that, right? So community engagement kind of activities. And so it's a nice comp, it's a nice mix. Um, and um, actually, I take that back, I just had to change board members. One of the three that I mentioned as Women's and Children's Administrator, um, she's a member for a nursing organization now, but um, her hospital system, um, we have someone who's um, in the pediatric realm in the Child and Adolescent Health Center. That is complemented, right, by the other members from the other tiers. And so it tends to be, my board is um, primarily practitioners. I have two practicing OBGYNs, um, one of whom is um, here at Michigan Medicine. She's representing the Michigan section of ACOD. Um, but two um, OBs, um, lots of nurses, um, doctorate mm -hmm. level, um, several of them, and um, uh, several other nurses. So I think almost everyone on my board, there's probably two or three of us who are more um, uh, fall into sort of the policy realm, but most um, most of the folks are practicing in some capacity at a local public health department or in a hospital or in a community-based organization. Yeah, of course. And it's that's the richness, right, of being able to pull on bringing up an issue in front of my board and asking about that, um, really thinking about how we do the work and. Um, uh, that's, you know, really thinking about um, how we choose what we work on and then how we choose to engage. Part of it is me um, finding out if those issues resonate with the membership and with the board um, and thinking, um, pulling on their experience. So um, some of the strategies that we use for policy change, um, uh, you know, we're, we are a 501c4, you know, it's, this isn't, we're not a tax deductible organization, we're a hardcore, we were built for advocacy, that's all we do, and we don't do forward-facing programming for the public, every once in a while we'll get a call from someone who's looking for services, and we obviously um, connect them where they need to be connected based on their geography, but our real audience is really just um, decision makers, so thinking about uh, the legislature primarily, the administration. Sometimes we'll do some federal advocacy if the funding stream is um, really critical to delivering um, maternal and child health in the state of Michigan. Um, and then also trying to impact things like um, Medicaid policy. So, um, you know, we're, we're working with the administration, but then we're also thinking about how does that actually um, get implemented by, by managed care, by the Medicaid health plans. And, you know, there's an, another lever there in that the state has a contract with the managed care plans. So we'll even do work in that area, right? So thinking about what does that contract language look like? Because we're really interested, very interested in not just what does a statute say, but how does it actually get implemented and how does it actually get realized on the ground? Does it actually make a difference for outcomes? And so um, sometimes um, we're, we're working you know, pretty far down, it can feel like a little bit down in the weeds as far as 
um, you know, contract language or even, um, you know, guidance language, sometimes things like L letters, which are local letters will come out from Medicaid after a policy is issued. If there's finding that it's not having the impact that they want, we will often advocate for them to send an L letter to the providers that are part of that issue and say, uh, are you aware, right? We have a policy around this. We have a rate change around this where we really want you to change the way in which things are happening so we can get better outcomes. So um, I'm again, not gonna read all these slides to you. Um, I just mentioned that we do most of our work at the state level um, and we do periodically do some work at the federal level. Obviously when you're thinking about any way that your work might be used in policy, it could also be very local. Um, and, and so I always just try to remind people and you know, quite frankly, some of the things that are most impactful can be done at the organization level. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work we've been doing around doulas. And quite frankly, one of the things around doulas is just, is an individual hospital welcoming to doulas. That's an individual hospital policy. That's not, certainly we could pass a statute that would require that. And we can pass policy that allows for Medicaid to pay for doulas, but the welcoming environment that's created through organizations and their own policies is, is also really important to think about how that gets, again, realized by the family and realized by, in this case, a doula who's trying to help them. In state government all the time and just want a real quick refresher, I always usually just tell people, you know, state government 101, uh, there's 148 legislators, uh, 110 in the House, 38 in the Senate. There's a couple of vacancies right now that'll be filled by special election um, as people move um, out, which is more common now with term limits. So Michigan, we have term limits, um, six years in the House and eight years in the Senate. So the longest serving legislator, if you take out folks who may have served a partial term is 14 years. It's really not a very long um, amount of time if you think about how long it might take for someone to establish any amount of expertise in an area. And so we're sort of always since the mid nineties operating from a place of sort of general education. So we're you know constantly in a mode of Meeting new, meeting new legislators, doing basic education around them. So again, when you see a lot of the materials that we might use forward facing with legislators, they probably feel really basic because they are. Because we have to start at that point before we can build any kind of conversation about you know, specific change. Um, just a reminder about how the process works and it can be different in other states. So in Michigan, a bill can be introduced in either the House or Senate. It will go to a committee, be assigned to a a standing committee or to the appropriations committee if it's a budget bill. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about budgets, but for policy issues, they'll be assigned to a standing committee. Right now in Michigan House, some bills have to pass through two committees. So they'll go through a, a committee that's specific around the content and then um, one that's a little bit higher up just to another check and balance. Then they'll go to the floor in either chamber. And if they're voted on, they'll be passed over to the other chamber. That same bill will travel through the same process. So a house bill that starts in the house will go through a house committee, passes on the house floor, passes over, goes over to the Senate, will be taken up in a Senate committee, pass the Senate and come back to the house before it's ordered and rolled and sent to the governor for her signature. Um, so. Um, do you know, you know, we've heard a lot about the new map that's coming mm -hmm. So yeah, the question was on the redistricting process um, that, um, you know, I, I think those maps are out right now for public comment. Um, yeah. I've read so many articles over the last six months, it's almost like you forget what, at what point we're at. But so based on the um, ballot proposal that created a redistricting commission, the commission's been meeting and putting forth maps um, for the state house, state senate, and congressional districts. And there are um, multiple maps that have been put forward as potential for all of those. And folks are commenting on them now. My understanding is that the process needs to be complete by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And as, so- As an organization, will you comment on those? Uh, we will not. We will not. Um, you know, as a 501c4, we're perfectly positioned to be political in a way that we could engage in election activities. We could uh, form a PAC if we wanted to. Uh, we could get really active on those maps. Um, it's been our longstanding theory that none of those things actually benefit us with regard to maternal and child health, right? That making yeah. ourselves partisan in any way or appearing to be partisan doesn't benefit yeah. us. And so- 
we don't um, engage in any of those things. We do do some basic election education. Um, we've done that primarily really from a very basic standpoint in the past ugh, six, seven election cycles. It even predates my time at the, at the council. Um, created um, what were kind of issue briefs or policy papers, and now they've become infographics. I'm going to talk about that phenomena. Um, but um, in partnership, originally it was a partnership with um, U of M, um, the Michigan section of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the council, um, relying heavily on some input um, from you all, um, some student work, the, the points as those things have become simpler, we haven't really needed your level of expertise to think about how to <laughs> lift those issues up to legislators. So um, it's been more of a, an exercise for those of us who really think about how to message um, with legislators. And um, so we have worked with the Michigan section of the American Academy of Pediatrics and Michigan section of ACOG because uh, really wanting to also have those materials that we're giving to um, prospective legislators. So they go to candidates just after the primary. Um, so we're mailing out, um, we did a five, a set of five infographics last time and I didn't bring them with me nor have I looked at them in almost two years. So um, you'll forgive me if I don't remember, but uh, I believe that they were around behavioral health, oral health, um, uh, one around maternal health and birth outcomes. So really thinking about things like low birth weights and um, those types of activities. Um, immunizations, hot topic, right? For most legislators come in with some sort of um, at least personal feeling around immunizations. And so um, the way that we structure those infographics that, you know, again, are really just going to someone who may not know anything about you know, they may not even have any personal experience with maternal or child health. It's structured really as a, um, just a couple quick facts that might grab their attention and then some things that are going right in the state, some things that are we doing that set us apart as leaders or things that are going well. And then sort of a, you know, real quick, you know, sort of bullet points around what we're looking to engage them on in the, in the year ahead, really as things there are so many um, folks really that are critical to um, how things actually get implemented. Sarah mentioned the bureaucracy and I would say, you know, the governor and the governor staff, but then the state departments really, you know, um, something can, ex you know, go exceedingly well because of really dedicated department staff or it can just sort of fall flat and nothing can happen. So it's important to have, for us to have relationships with those folks and also, to see through things that we've advocated for. So a good example, um, there's a $7.4 million in the FY22 budget. So I'm gonna talk about budgets, but the budget that just started this year, um, one of the things that's happening with that is um, try to increase home visiting services for families that have substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. And so the department is charged with how do we spend the $7.4 million and how do we get it out to um, home visiting agencies, it's not enough to cover the whole state. So they went through a needs assessment and really identified the 10 counties where um, the purpose and intent of the funding will be, um, you know, best met. And then really think about, you know, an implementation plan. Well, we're, we're tracking that, right? Because one of the things is, a, is around placing navigators in um, hospitals or prenatal care settings. And those are those are the council's members. And we want to really, we want to weigh in on what that policy looks like about how those navigators who might help families get connected to home visiting programs, how they're situated, how they're paid, what the expectations are around them for two reasons. We obviously want that policy to be written in a way that, that those on the ground think that it will be most effective. I also am always pressing them on, we want the money to be spent and we want it to be spent well. And we want data so we can show outcomes because that's how we'll get that money. We'll keep it in the state budget and we'll grow it over time. And so it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's really the same thing, right? We all want good outcomes. I want um, very specific things that I know I can use to continue to advocate for it. Other folks obviously want to make sure that the policy and the way it's crafted is functional on the ground. 
and will actually serve families well. And so it's really the same thing. Um, I just am always looking for something different. Sarah knows I'm always looking for data that I can use. Um, do you want me to catch up? It's okay. Yeah. I just want to make a quick point about advocacy versus lobbying. And so I'm um, thinking about yourselves. And so, you know, I'm not going to guess about any of your motivations for being here today or what you might, how you might think of yourselves as an advocate. Um, it's pretty unlikely um, most of you are not lobbyists, right? And you wouldn't want, you potentially don't want to be. My poor, both of my children have had this experience of having to say what their parents do. And um, it's pretty amazing. People have lots of negative conversations about lobbyists. My husband is a multi-client lobbyist, so I guess he's more evil than I am. Um, <laughs> but, you know, everyone is equipped to do advocacy, right? It's general education. It's sharing the experience that you have. It's putting your perspective forward. If you're not getting paid to advocate for certain legislation on a regular basis, you don't have to register as a lobbyist, right? You're not, that's not your vocation. You're just advocating as part of your, um, part of your position, part of your experience. And the only thing you have to be careful of then is sometimes organizations have limits, right? On what they'll allow you to do as far as advocacy, especially if um, what you're speaking, uh, your position is different than theirs. So it, there's just always this question about what's advocacy versus lobbying. I say to people that we're an advocacy organization because I think that we are. We spend most of our time doing education. And then I am also, you know, obviously registered as a lobbyist because we do try to really impact very specifically certain legislation or um, make very direct asks of legislators. I'm going to go through a couple of examples. So you have a question right now because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a couple of examples because I think what Sarah was hoping is you could see the kind of work and the way that we do it. I think the way, the best way to do that, show you is to, to just talk through a couple of examples, some of which these might look familiar to you. Um, it just so happened that I was, it was very easy for me to pick a few examples that have some sort of um, university connection. So um, this is perennial and I don't really know why. So we've been trying for, this is the fourth time this bill's been introduced. I think I put the third time, but um, I think I figured out last week in committee, it's actually the fourth time the bill's been reintroduced. We're trying to update Michigan's child safety seat law to be more in keeping with the Michigan, or the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration recommendations around child safety seats. Michigan's law, and I can show you a grid and it, it just really does not line up well with the recommendations that are made now about keeping children rear facing and turning them around forward facing when they reach a certain weight or age. And then also moving them from a five point harness forward facing seat to a booster seat. So what we're trying to do is, is put that in better shape. It will not, um, uh, and this is a frustration I think for many who are experts in this field, it will not completely mirror uh, if the, even if the bill that's currently introduced passes, it will not completely mirror the MIAP or NHTSA standards. We are not in a situation politically where we feel like we can um, keep kids in booster seats till 12. So this bill will cut off the booster seat age at eight. Um, and again, that's a frustration, I think, for some who are um, experts in the field and understand that, you know, they're significantly uh, could impact deaths and also injuries. But it is also a political reality that, you know, based on conversations with legislators, we just can't get there. So at 1030, and I won't be in Lansing, but I think the House Transportation Committee is going to um, move this bill out of committee, which, uh, as we talked about earlier, is sort of the first step in this, this bill's journey um, in the House. We've gotten close with this before, <laughs> so I don't want to guess what's going to happen. We've had weird things happen before. And this is a great example of something that sounds really simple, right? It doesn't really sound that complicated, but it can get very political very fast. Um, and it's a good wake up call, I think, for those of us who um, are big believers in child safety, seat, big believers in sort of, um, you know, changing to the current standards to understand that there's also a heavy current of sort of personal, personal responsibility or personal freedom or, um, you know, sort of, uh, libertarian sort of attitude that runs pretty strong through uh, the majority caucuses in both the Senate and the House. So it doesn't take long 
uh, for a couple of comments to be made about, well, shouldn't we just let parents decide? They know what's best for their kids. And, you know, then you got a runaway conversation and you need to sort of bring it back to, a, you know, a conversation about we know better, so we do better. And, you know, uh, sharing with them just enough of the science around why uh, it's really important to do things like keep infants rear facing. And so it's that balance. Again, this um, one pager is actually from our um, partner on this um, project, the Michigan Academy of Pediatrics. Um, this is, you know, we've been sort of finessing this for obviously multiple sessions. Um, so Sarah wanted me to give you a sort of a downside. I mean, this is one where I'm hopeful, but I'm, it's kind of embarrassing, right? That we can't get this done. Um, we've, we have done everything you can sort of think of. We've um, answered every question. It's just sometimes when you run into these hard felt ideologies, it can be difficult and conversations can run away that you're not part of. And so one time when this bill a couple of sessions ago got to caucus, which is sort of the uh, final conversation that happens among um, Republicans or Democrats prior to a floor vote, um, you know, there's a, a runaway conversation going on in caucus. None of us are there who can answer any of the questions, right? And so um, the sponsor of the bill, um, it, you know, she was getting beat up by her colleagues, really asking questions that she couldn't answer. And, you know, next thing you know, everyone walks out of there and their minds changed, right? And they're not going to vote for the bill now. People that told us they were going to vote for the bill aren't going to vote for the bill. And that's, you know, that it's understanding the process and all those points and trying to really make sure. So, you know, had I had that to do differently, I would have made sure that the sponsor went into it with more information, right? That she felt more armed before she went to that caucus meeting and that conversation got some steam going to it. Can you explain to us, <clears throat> who are you talking to? Where are the individual conversations? Sure. Who's in that room? Yeah. That's question one. Sure. And then question two, does it make a difference for your work if the name on there is the Michigan uh, Academy of Pediatrics or the AAP versus mm -hmm. the University of Michigan? Whatever. I got another example on that one. But um, so uh, you're identifying who it almost always when a bill's introduced, you'll have a sponsor. So your first conversation, if you want to get something introduced, is to try to get someone to introduce it, right? So you've got to get a champion. You've got to go have a conversation with someone. They've got to feel strongly enough about it. In this case, um, it's Representative Bronna Colley. She's from Lenaway County. She happens to chair the health policy committee. So she has some standing among her colleagues as sort of, you know, uh, understanding what's healthy, what's good. In her case, her personal motivation for introducing the bill, she's a grandmother. So she is very in tune, right? Right right now with what car seats look like and the fact that she has car seats and wanting to think about child safety. Um, so Representative Kali um, agreed to introduce the bill. She did. When the bill was introduced, it was referred to the House Transportation Committee because the bill amends the vehicle code. So it's pretty common. Uh, they'll look at, you know, what statute is amended and there's sort of, you know, sort of generally accepted committees that, that things get referred to, that referred to the Transportation Committee. So then we're going to talk to those Transportation Committee members, right? Most importantly, the chair. The chair of the committee decides whether the bill actually even gets a hearing. So that person is critical. Um, the, the committee chair is critical. Sometimes if the committee chair won't cooperate with you, you can go to leadership, which would be the speaker's office, and the speaker can tell the committee chair to take your bill up. And now, now you kind of know what situation you're in, right? Kind of a little bit of an adversarial. Like they're not happy about that. They don't agree with your policy, but they're doing it because their superior told them to. Um, so you've got a hurdle to overcome right there, right? It's probably going to be a sort of um, contentious situation. And the, other than that, we're talking to committee members, making sure we have the votes to get the bill out of committee, and then starting to do some general education on the floor. And especially lessons learned on this bill, you know, lots of times you can just work the committee members. And once you get out of committee, the rest of the members sort of rely on the fact that the committee's done their job. This is one where we would want to sort of blanket the whole house, right, to, to stack those um, conversations that we talked about earlier, where people have what they consider to be pretty innocent questions, but they run away pretty fast. You know, a question about, well, my nine-year-old is less than four foot nine. Am I gonna have to keep him in a booster seat? Or you know, my, my grandmother who's 80 is less than four foot nine. Does she need to be in a booster seat? You know, sort of Probably. ridiculously 
<laughs> Probably, but she's an adult. She can choose for herself. I mean, um, we had a, this question in committee last two weeks ago. But, um, but yes, you know, making sure that there's an easy answer to that so that those questions don't run away and, um, and, and that kind of thing. So we're talking to committee members. Um, this actually doesn't have any organization on it. Um, it just has, says the American Academy of Pediatrics. So we normally would leave space for a logo. I think we probably ran out of space. You know, one page is our big deal, right? We want everything on one page. We want to just be able to use one page of paper or email one page. They won't really look at more than that. Um, two pages maybe. Um, sometimes you want to show a lot of logos and a lot of support for things. Sometimes it's not necessary. In this case, you know, just wanting to get the information out. This is that grid I talked about that talks about, you know, current statute and sort of what happens in the bill. It's probably a little small for you to see, but um, it just depends to your question, Sarah. Um, if I could hold that, actually, I've got okay. another example. Really? And then how am I doing in time? I'm running out of time, though. Okay, let me skip ahead then. So um, this is an oral health piece. Um, you can see we worked on a law around dental therapy, and I will say about this specific infographic that we worked with Cheer on some data that they were already producing for on the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services really to dig deep on actual utilization. And so um, the only thing I'll say about this is sometimes you have opponents who are using data too, and they're using it in a way where you're saying, well, that, that's, you're, that's really deceiving, right? Mm -hmm. So for the, for the, in this case, our opponent was the General Association and they were saying, well, this many dentists are enrolled in Medicaid, so it must be on it basically saying it must be the fault of the people who are on Medicaid. They're just not, they're just not going to, you know, it's not trying to find a dentist. But the reality is, is that we wanted to look at how many of those folks ever actually got to a dentist, how many of them ever actually had a paid service. So what we were trying to actually demonstrate here is that only a small percentage of dentists, a licensed dentists in the state of Michigan actually bill Medicaid. So if you think about it, that means that they actually took in patients and actually build the program. So when you think about it from an actual accessibility um, standpoint for the patient, we were just trying to demonstrate how small that universe is to really try to promote the idea that there should be other providers. That's, that's a good example of a, an opponent sort of using data in the other way. I talked about the budget a little bit. Um, I'm gonna use a budget example to, to answer Sarah's question. So I'll just tell you that the budget is uh, the state's fiscal year is October 1st to September 30. And if someone were to say to you the FY22 budget, which I said to you earlier, I actually mean the budget that's already started October 1st. So it's actually the 21-22 budget and we say FY22. So the budget that we'll start working on now, we'll start calling FY23. It'll be the budget that starts October 1st of next year on 22. So um, that's just important to know, like if you're talking to someone, because it can get confusing really fast if you're not living in that world. The governor um, puts forward recommendations in February and then the process begins, right? The legislature reacts to that and the advocacy organizations react to that and work off of that. But then um, the legislature will put forward versions of its own. And so you're trying to manage the proposed version, the House version, the Senate version, knowing that all three of them eventually are gonna sit down and negotiate. And you, ideally, if you want something in the budget, um, it's just a strategy, right? Do I want the governor to propose it and have the legislature react to it? Do I want to wait and have the legislature put it in? Part of it is you're trying to figure out what's the strength of the person who's putting it forward and what's the strength of their vocation to keep it in, right? So um, it's a little bit of a, a game um, for a lot of the things around this healthy moms, healthy babies, which has included postpartum extension, which has included... Um, some home visiting expansion in the last two years it has included um, funding for MC3, which I want to talk about. Um, those came from the governor. The governor recommended those things um, because some of us asked her to, <laughs> frankly, uh, right? So we're, we, were, we were making the calculated decision that it would be best coming from her and that we would fight to keep it in the budget and that we would educate legislators to keep it in the budget. So MC3, if you don't know, is... Um, is a, is a program created here, um, Michigan Medicine. It's a, a, a child care collaborative um, known as MC3, uh, was originally created for um, primary care providers and pediatric providers to get expert psychiatric consultation from staff here 
at, at Michigan Medicine so that they could better care for their patients out in the community. It's um, since that since the original creation, there's also a perinatal component. Um, so Dr. Maria Music um, has created a perinatal component. So the same thing can be offered in primary care and obstetric practices for pregnant women. And so um, this all has happened um, over the course of the last eight or 10 years. I'm not actually sure I know, um, but with some funding from the state. And so um, it's really cobbled together. It's difficult to track, which makes it hard to advocate for. And the MC3 for kids and MC3 for moms, we call it, um, they come from two different pots. So from an advocacy perspective, what we're trying to do is keep track of all that, um, make sure we're pushing on all the right pressure points to keep that funding in and hopefully grow that funding over time. So like I said, the governor made a proposal around increasing MC3 for moms, which was great, because then we can ask to keep that funding in the budget. And then this is an example of what Sarah just asked. Is this best coming from Michigan Medicine or is this best coming from others? I would argue, and I think we've successfully convinced your colleagues here who run the program, it's probably best for it to come from those of us who speak on behalf of the providers who are on the ground using the service. So if you think about it, you're providing the service, you have the contract with the state, but really what we did in this thank you letter is point out that the Community Mental Health Association of Michigan sees the value in this. So those folks who are offering you know, deeper end services, uh, MIAP, so the pediatricians, the obstetricians, um, our organization that, that you know, thinks of all of those um, folks. It's really best for us to say, we need this service to be available so that our providers, our members can, can serve their patients in the community and hopefully prevent um, further psychiatric um, crises or, or events. And so we were the ones who um, you know, crafted this thank you letter after there was um, the funding was continued in the budget. So we were having those conversations to, to keep the governor's recommendation in and then thanking, um, thanking the, uh, the governor in this case, but this went to all the legislative members who were also part of that. I want to be cognizant of that, I'm, yeah, and I'm really sorry that no, no, we lost some time, um, but I think a question that might be of benefit to people here is for people at the university doing research or evaluation work, I think sometimes people don't know where to get a foot in the door. Do they come to you? Do they come? Do they go to Medicaid? Do they like? How do you? How how is the match made? Where can, you start finding yeah. people that intersect with your priority topics? It can depend, right? So I think when you've done research and something, or you're interested in it, um, thinking about who those are the natural constituencies are for it. So it is a pretty much an association for everything. Um, so there's provider associations, there's uh, organizational associations like the hospital association. So I think it's thinking about looking. At their policy agendas and finding out if it fits with anything that they're already working on or already shown some interest in. Um, they might, you know, potentially have some political capital that they would be willing to expend on that issue. Uh, I think digging into um, one of the slides that I had was um, sort of on some of the collaborative process. You know, there are no shortage of state advisory committees. Um, I'm on about 30 of them, believe it or not. Um, for just about anything. Some of them are short-term, right? They'll only last for a certain amount of time. They're built around a specific topic or area or legislation. And some of them are ongoing for a long time. So like the Maternal Infant Health and Equity Improvement Plan. So the state has a, a plan around reducing infant and maternal mortality, has lots of components to it. There's groups of people getting together all the time to think about how to move that plan forward. So if your research falls into one of the areas that's been identified, so. Um, you know, I mentioned doulas earlier, or um, reducing preterm birth. Um, that's a group of people who are already really thoughtfully getting together and saying, how do we advance policy in this area? So I think it's about showing up at those meetings, making those relationships, and then thinking about who appears that they have, in, the, in that case, it might be me, might be the council. If, you're, if your area, subject area is different, it might be someone else. Um, but, but you've got to get at those tables where those policy conversations are happening. Um, I, I have seen it where people have gone directly to a legislator um, and said, I've got this great idea, you should introduce this. Um, it doesn't always work 
that well, just because you're, I think I've already mentioned you're dealing with someone who probably doesn't have that much experience either. Um, and so then you're leaving all of us who that's sort of our professional vocation out and then the bill gets introduced and then we're reacting to it. And sometimes that reacting can come from a, you know, a defensive or a negative place. Whereas if some of that work were done on the front end, it could come from a more um, collaborative space and really be put forward in a way that really helps the sponsor not have to deal with all of that. You know, sometimes bills will die under sort of just this, well, you guys don't feel you know, like everybody's saying something different to me, I, I give up. Um, so, you know, it, I think if you have a good concept, it's important to find the natural constituency for that and see if you can, um, you know, cultivate relationships with organizations that are doing advocacy. Um, you know, lots and lots of folks, you know, have staff like me and in Lansing, they also have a multi-client lobbyist. So they also have someone whose full job is just um, to, you know, help cultivate those relationships with legislators. The other big mistake I see people make when they go directly to the legislators, you're gonna pick the wrong one. You're gonna pick the wrong legislator. You're gonna go to someone here locally and they're not gonna be the chair of the committee. They're not gonna be on the right committee. They're, they're not gonna have any political cachet to get it done. And I hate to say it that way, but the reality is, again, do you wanna win? Do you wanna get your issue done? Then you want some expertise or some advice about um, how, to, how to build that momentum and how to pick the right person to get it done for you, which we don't always do. Like I told you on the car seat bill, right? We, a couple of times we picked sponsors that we thought were really well positioned. And for and, and in one case, the sponsor ended up being the problem, right? People were personally irritated with her. So it wasn't about our bill, it was about her. Um, and you know, that happens too. But you're it is a lot of um, as you all I think probably already know, and this is the distasteful part maybe of politics, is just it's a lot of that, right? It's a lot of relationships, it's a lot of right moment, right time, right space. Um, but there are um, those of us, and I, I, you know, I learn something new every day, but there are a lot of people who, you know, we have some level of knowledge of those things that can help guide a conversation. So I think we're at a yeah. time we're going to have to leave people, although the people in the room, I think you'll yeah, probably be willing stay. to take additional questions um, or people on the, on the Zoom that want to stand. Um, so I just want to be more concrete. So if people here have an interest in like an MCH issue sure. that's on your priority yeah. list that you show, yeah. do they contact, is sure. it okay for people to reach sure. out and contact yeah. you or do you ever play matchmaker of like, well, it's kind of yes. like us, but actually lots of times. To them. Yes. So uh, one quick example, I'm sorry if those of you on the, are dropping off on the Zoom, but um, I'm on the Child Death Review Advisory. So um, uh, you, you probably many of you know that we, um, the state reviews all deaths of children zero to 18. So there's a state team that thinks about sort of trends in that and what should we be doing around policy. One of the trends is that we have a really crappy medical examiner system in Michigan, really crappy. Um, and we need to make it better. And so some folks looking at me saying, well, you're sitting here, you know, you're always interested in what's going to, could you help us with that? That's way outside my, my realm. As I mentioned about like adoption, seriously. I mean, medical examiners, yes, we're very interested. We like to like to know specifically why children die. And I want as a citizen, I want those medical examinations to be accurate. But really who, the, the real constituency for that was the Prosecutors Association, right? I mean, in mm. the end, you want quality medical examinations so that you can base potentially a prosecution on them. So the Prosecuting Attorneys Association really was the better place for that conversation to happen and for them to pull together a constituency. Certainly we can look at it, we can be happy about it, the, the fact that I would have, that's, that's a heavy lift, right? Um, to create a whole a new structure for medical examination in Michigan, think about how it gets funded, that kind of thing. That, you know, there's there's a group of people, um, prosecuting attorneys association and medical examiners, but think about it. You're trying to impose a new structure on them. You can't expect them to necessarily lead that. It's to sort of be someone who has a, a very direct interest, but um, so there's an example for you where I hope that happens, but not me, not it. I'm happy um, based on what I know after um, I worked in the legislature for 13 years 
um, and get around a fair amount. I don't always know, but sometimes I know someone else you could ask that might know. So yeah, if you have an issue or um, have something that you think is right for policy, I'd love to hear about it. Gotcha. And before we go, I, I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions. I would just put a, a plug, um, look for uh, Michigan Council on Maternal and Child Health. Um, Google their organization. They have a very good Friday newsletter oh, wow. that summarizes. I learned so much from that, especially <laughs> as the slide. budget is working through um, and what the weekly newsletter does often is say, here's the latest mm -hmm. on um, uh, what's happening. The Senate side says this, the other side says this, here's what's in, here's what's out. Um, and I just found that to be the most Good. digestible version of a budget recap that I've been able to find. So, and, I'll, and also a lot of other good things. Good. So people, uh, I think our take home message is, uh, feel free to contact Amy if you think you have something that intersects with that space. Um, and then just take those lessons to heart about how difficult it is to get policy made with people who don't have the level of expertise as the people who study it for their mm -hmm. real lives. But can't do any of it without you, frankly. I mean, you know, the most successful thing in committee, just to say, is to bring it, is to bring someone who's clinical, who has, you know, can just dazzle them with yeah. uh, the expertise and to bring, or, or to bring a, an actual, you know, person with lived experience. So, you know, in Thank the case you. of CHS,